Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll be focusing on those words from 1 John uh, chapter 2. Every year about this time, my wife and I have the same conversation. I look over at her and I say, Well, honey, it's New Year's. What's your New Year's resolution? And she always says the same thing. She looks at me and says, I'm going to make the same resolution I make every year, to make no more resolutions. And she says, I always make that resolution because I know that I'm going to keep it. And she's right. Between the two of us, she's the one who always keeps her resolution, right? So often we make these resolutions and we have a hard time in actually keeping them. And, and, and we all know that by this time of the year, we probably all need to make changes. I mean, I don't know about you, but it seems like all of us, right, since about Thanksgiving, we've all probably overate, overspent, maybe had uh, ruined some of our relationships or damaged some relationships. And about this time of the year, it's time to make some well-needed changes in our life. And so we make these resolutions, but we have such a hard time actually keeping them. We're so focused on what we want to do, and yet many of them never actually get done. And that's why I'm so glad to, to be going back to 1 John here and look at this section of Scripture and see what God's Word has to say about life transformation, really how we can uh, look at the next year to come. And just to remember, it's been, you know, we took two weeks off uh, for the Christmas season and just to kind of remind us where we've been. We've been using this visual aid as we've gone through 1 John. We said, this is what we want to become as a congregation in 2017. Uh, 1 John is, is a book that we've, we've entitled this sermon series, Connect. Because 1 John is all about how we as a congregation connect to Jesus Christ and connect to one another. And so the first sermon, the first four verses of 1 John are about how we connect to God through having a relationship with Jesus Christ. It says that, that if you believe in Jesus and you have fellowship with the Son, we have fellowship with one another. And then the second sermon went on to explain about what keeps us from having fellowship with one another. We talked about very often we can have a life that it's hidden away, that we hide parts of our life from our loved ones. We try to hide them from God. We live a secret life. And God says, come into the light. Let yourself be exposed to God's light. Repent of your sin. Be exposed to what's really going on in your life. And the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. And being vulnerable before God and one another actually not only connects us to God, but we talked about how that makes deep connections to one another, when we're vulnerable with one another. And then the third sermon was all about what, what God says in that section when, when John says, we can say we know God, we can all say I know God, but God has called us to actually live that out. We can all know him in our head, but God wants us to know him in our heart. And that will lead us to love God and love one another with our lives. And now we go on to another section, uh, 1 John chapter 2, and it's beginning in verse 12. And to be honest, I didn't really know what this section was all about. I, I kind of wanted to skip over it. It, was, it seemed kind of strange. It was a, a, a kind of a, a poetic interlude, and I didn't know how it fit with the whole picture of 1 John and, and how this really applied to our lives. And I was reading on it, and I just kind of wanted to maybe touch on it and move on to something else. But then I was reading a couple different commentaries, and they all came to the same conclusion. And it kind of was like the key that unlocked this whole section from me. Uh, in this section, John says, I'm writing to you, dear children. And then he goes on to say, I'm writing to you fathers. And then I'm writing to you young men. And he goes back through it again. He says, I'm writing to you children. And I'm writing to you fathers. And I'm writing to you young men. I thought, what is he talking about? Why is he talking to these different groups of the church? But then I read that it's not he's actually talking to three different groups in the church. 
He's talking to all of the Christians and he's saying, this is who you are in Christ. You're all children in Christ. You're all fathers in Christ. You're all young men in Christ. And we're going to see that instead of stressing uh, a New Year's resolution, the Bible is going to lead us to, to, first of all, have a New Year's identity. That our identity is the most important thing. It's even more important than New Year's resolution. So, so let's look at this section. So if you want to open up your worship folders, if you have your Bible, you can go there. I'm just going to focus on verses 12, 13, and 14 of 1 John chapter 2. And he begins by saying, I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Again, I don't think John is, is talking about a certain section of the congregation of little children. I believe he's talking to everybody in the congregation, all Christians, and he's saying, I'm writing to you, dear children, and you've become a child of God because your sins have been forgiven on the count of his name, on the count of the name of Jesus. Because Jesus came in as a child into this world, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for all of your sins, rose again. God looks at you not as somebody who's full of guilt and shame. He doesn't see your past anymore. He doesn't th- see the, the things that you have done that you wish you could forget. He sees you as a little child. Now, what does that mean? Well, what's the best qualities of a little child? Have, have you ever been to a party where it just seems kind of boring or awkward? Maybe this is kind of how your holidays went. If, if you get around family and you haven't been around family for a while, and, and maybe by now you all have different likes or dislikes, you don't have much in common except you share some of the same lineage or last name, and you get together, and you know, it's kind of awkward, you don't really know what to do, and then someone brings in a baby. And they plop a baby down in the middle of the room, and it comes alive all of a sudden, doesn't it? The room just changes. Everybody looks at the baby. Um, everything the baby does is cute, right? They're playing on their toys and banging on their drums, and, and they're dressed in their cute little Christmas outfit, and everything they say is cute. And you watch them go over to their parents and hold up their arms, and the room just changes with the baby in the room. Now, think about this. John is saying your identity is a little child. I'm writing to you, little children. And so now I want you to picture this. The Holy Trinity is having a party, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you're plopped down in the middle of that party. And, and Jesus is saying, I died for that child. I, I paid for the adoption of that child. And the Holy Spirit is saying, I, I put faith in that child. I've dwelled inside that child. That's, that's God's child. And the Father is saying, look at my adopted child. I'm so proud of this child. And they're ooing and eyeing over you. You're that child. Because you have been forgiven for the sake of Jesus Christ. Now, now think about that. That's a powerful idea. The writer John understands the power of our identity. We, we see this in, in his other book. You see this same writer, John, was actually a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus. He walked with Jesus, and he wrote about his time with Jesus in a biography called the Gospel of John. And when he was, uh, he was a part of that story, and yet when he wrote himself into the story, He didn't name himself. If you read the Gospel of John, whenever there's interaction between Jesus and John, do you know how he he calls himself? He says, the one whom Jesus loved. What a powerful way to look at yourself. Now, some people said, well, John was more loved than anyone else. I don't think that's what it's about at all. John identified himself as the one whom Jesus loved. And that's how he looked at himself. That was his identity. So think about that. If that was your New Year's identity, that you were God's child that's been plopped in the middle of, of, of God's party, if you were the one whom Jesus loved, instead of going into the New Year full of guilt and shame and sadness and, and, and beating yourself up, you know that, that God has loved you in Christ, that you have been forgiven, that you are a child of God. You're the one whom Jesus loved. 
And if you would focus on your New Year's identity, I don't know if you'd have to worry so much about your New Year's resolutions. Let's look at the next category. Verse 13. I am writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. Again, I don't believe that, that John is, um, is saying, now I'm talking to a certain segment of the group called the fathers. I believe he's looking at the whole congregation, men, women, boys, girls, everybody in the congregation. He's saying, you are all fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. Now, why would you want to be called a father? What, what is the best quality of a father? Now, some of you maybe didn't have a good experience with your father, but, but if, you, if you think about what is the best qualities of a father, what is a father supposed to be? And when I think about that, one word comes to mind, wisdom. And, and John even says, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. They have knowledge. They have wisdom. You know him who is from the beginning. You know Christ. See, if I go to my father, and, and I don't go to him to find out the latest technology, what's the latest app on my smartphone, or, or you know, what's the latest uh, TV show out there, or what's the latest technology, or, or what's the latest pop group out there right now. Um, he, he probably couldn't tell me the latest information, but my father has wisdom. And really, that's what we're lacking in our culture, isn't it? We have lots of information, but we have almost no wisdom. And so if I want wisdom, I go to my father, and my father will tell me, this is the way you should go. This is what is important in life. This is, where, this is what you should decide to do, because he's been there. He's got wisdom. Now think about that. John is saying, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Spirit of God living in you, who is the wisdom of God. Christ lives in you, who is called, you know, wonderful counselor, right? So you are, in, in a way, wise like a father. And, and we know the right thing to do. We know what we're supposed to be doing. But so often, instead of following what the, the Spirit is guiding us to do, instead of following the Word of God, we suppress that and follow our flesh. But what if you embrace this New Year's identity as being a wise father? I don't know if we would need to focus so much on our New Year's resolutions if we embraced our New Year's identity. All right, let's go on to the third category. He says, uh, the second half of verse 13, I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. He picks up this idea later on uh, in the last part of verse 14. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. You are strong, and the uh, word of God lives in you. So again, he's not talking about a certain group of the congregation, the young men, the youth group in the congregation. He's saying, all of you are the young men. All of you. Now, now why would I, or why would we want to be called youths? Why would we want to be called people in their youth? Well, what is the best quality of young people? What are their best qualities? We send young people, 18, 19, 20-year-olds, we send them to the front lines of our battle. Of our, uh, uh, we send them out to be soldiers. Why? Because they are strong. Because they are fearless. Because they are agile. We, we gather around our TV sets and we watch young men play on a football field or play on a basketball court because they're fearless and they're strong and they're agile. And God says, no matter what your age, as a believer in Jesus, that's your identity, a young person. You see, I, I've talked to too many people, and I've done this to myself too, is that before the day starts, we've already self-sabotaged ourselves. Um, before the day starts, we say things like, well, I'm just a sinner, so I'm going to sin. Well, you know, that's just what I do. I... I'm a liar, you know, I, that's just what I do. You know, I drink too much, I eat too much. I, you know, I just always put my foot in my mouth. I always do those things. That's just who I am. And we're identifying not with who we are in Christ, but our sinful nature. 
And that's not our true identity. Yes, we sin. Yes, we have a sinful nature. But as a forgiven, loved child of God, you don't need to embrace that identity. You struggle against that idea and identity. And in Christ, you are a young person, spiritually speaking. Because he says, the word of God lives in you. The word of God lives in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you with the word of God dwelling in you. And you can overcome the evil one. You don't have to self-sabotage yourself. You can overcome sin, not because you're so strong, but because the word of God lives in you, because God allows you to overcome the evil one. Now, this is powerful, embracing this idea of identity. It's powerful when I think about parenting. Um, over the years, I, I, we've tried to do something different. It doesn't, we don't always remember this, but when we do, we're happy we do as parents. Uh, when we see our kids misbehaving, Instead of just going around saying, don't do that, or do that, or do better, or don't do that, or do... What we've tried to say is, remember who you are. That's not who you are. When you act like that, that's not who you are. You're a forgiven child of God. You're my child. That's not who you are when you act like that. And, and remembering, reminding them their identity. And what's... What's true for us as individuals, as Christians, I believe is also true for us as a church. How are we going to identify ourselves? I I wrote about this in in, in my latest blog, and I put it in our our newsletter also. This idea that uh, we need to remember we're not a country club. But our real identity is a hospital for sinners. And as we go into the 2017, if we embrace that identity... That will lead to how we actually act, how we're going to to live out our calling as Christians in this community of believers, in this congregation. And so I I agree. I think it's good to make New Year's resolutions. I'll probably get around to making some. I'll try to make some changes. But before we jump to making New Year's resolutions to try to do more or be better, remember who you are. Instead of just focusing on your New Year's resolution, focus on your New Year's identity in Christ. You are a loved child of God. You are a wise father. You are a strong young man in Christ. Amen. Please stand.